Welcome to another edition of Hit The Lights podcast. I have a very special guest with me today, a Mr. Derek Thompson. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll drop the mister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and keep it perfectly human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, it's obviously uh, going to be a, an interesting conversation, I'm sure. Um, but maybe you could uh, take us back to your early days and how you came to join the electrical industry. Yes, of course. Uh, very early days, I can tell <laughs> you. Uh, I, I left school in 1976 um, and arrived in uh, a local industrial estate with the option of taking up either the trade of joinery or carpentry or that of being an apprentice electrician. And but truthfully, I knew little about either. Uh, but I was drawn immediately uh, simply because it was the first premises on the business estate that was the electrical contractor and I walked into the air gate and thoroughly enjoyed five years of an industrial and commercial apprenticeship with a fairly large uh, and high standard electrical contractor there in Northern Ireland. Uh, so with five years there, working quite a lot of time in textile, textile industry there, um, Spent far too many months pulling in four core armor 240s and all sorts of things. Mm. Got through that pretty well. Um, during the period I uh, was uh, nominated to be the Edmondson Apprentice of the Year and it was successfully packed away the tr- a plane off to London for the first time in my life yeah. uh, <laughs> to be treated to the, uh, the joys of the capital city and the Edmondson ECA Apprentice of the Year competition. Um, at the end of my uh, apprenticeship, I was asked if I would uh, take up a position in the estimating office. The company was growing and developing. Again, I had really not much of an idea what estimating was, but it, uh, it had some promises with it. And uh, I went up and joined the estimating team there and spent uh, quite a few years then developing commercial skills, um, which gave me an insight into the cut and thrust, the nip and tuck, the tensions of commercial life, yeah. um, uh, the joys and the pain of winning and losing contracts there. Yeah. Sorry, was it a relatively new company then? At the, at no, the, time? the company uh, had been established for quite a number of years. Um, and in fact, they celebrated, I think, their 50th year of business there a few years back. Uh, sadly, they, they no longer trade, but um, they'd been going for quite some time. And uh, the owner had uh, been a self-made man. He started off life on a bike, wiring chicken uh, houses, and right. built up the business to a uh, fairly substantial uh, size of business at that time. You know, mm. um, so I, I I entered estimating and spent a bit of time there and progressed through into management and all the joys and ecstasy of that as well. A difficult place to be trying to figure out the uh, the, the 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 difficulties of being in a competitive environment, which um, up until then I think many uh, workers, including myself, don't really understand the competitive age that there is and the the the, the unseen engine room of the estimate department uh, in businesses here. So I, I learned a lot about the commercial difficulties, the pressures that that puts on to reduce overheads to preserve profit to even achieve a profit. Uh, so that really honed my uh, whole, uh, I suppose, previously naive idea about how electrical contractors work. And you, you get an insight into the, the difficulties of commercial life and highly competitive challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I progressed to the company. I stayed with that company for 25 years. Got a watch to prove it. Right. Um, enjoyed my time. Uh, worked with many very good people, uh, hardworking people there. Um, and I left the company and became, I suppose, deliberately unemployed for a short time. Uh, and then I joined, uh, I left because of the, 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 the absolute challenge of commercial life. It's a, it's a very, very difficult environment to be in. And I sympathize even today with uh, any contractor, small, medium or large enterprises, that have got to deal with the pressures of the commercial life, and especially now when we've got the difficulties of the pandemic. Mm. 
Mm. Um, so anyway, we, we worked our way up to senior management and left the company uh, voluntarily, good terms with the owners. And uh, I took up a position here with the Electrical Train Trust. Uh, my own uh, conscience and career and mind was towards to try and do something uh, and work in a charitable um, environment. So Electrical Train Trust uh, offered me the opportunity to do that. So I joined their team again to try and uh, maybe at this stage of my career give back a little bit and help um, encourage the opportunity take of apprenticeships, of authentic apprenticeship training mm. uh, and raise the quality and the standards in the local Northern Ireland electrical industry at least there. So we spent a bit of time doing that. Um, so were there any particular issues at the time when you were stepping into that role within the industry? So what would that have been, about early yes. 2000s? Well, we, we've, we've, we've uh, the UK and I suppose Northern Ireland in particular have... Um, been in and out of recession uh, in Northern Ireland. We came close to depression uh, with the um, with the difficulties of the economy. Uh, so the issues there were certainly um, the supply and demand, the ultra competitive nature of tendering, uh, and they might refer to that as sub-economic tendering. That became a real difficulty in the trade. Uh, there's patches of it still today, I think, of people tendering below that cost to try and win contracts and hoping uh, as an act of faith and trust that they might be able to squeeze something out by vari- variations of the contract there. So uh, yeah, that, that was a feature and has been a feature throughout uh, I suppose that period. Mm. However, the uh, my uh, brief was to uh, help the team here at Electrical Chain Trust to build up the quality control and oversight of uh, the level three apprenticeship here in Northern Ireland, and and uh, I brought my own, I suppose, apprenticeship uh, background and also my commercial understanding of the industry, and contacts and the lots of friends that I have in the industry there, uh, who, who who appreciate still to this day, uh, to try and think a little bit more about improving the control and the management and the output of the apprenticeship there. So mm-hmm. the program did improve, uh, and that improvement is measured by locally here the education training inspector through audit processes so progression retention the output all these language that um, ETI and Ofsted use those were all uh, good to excellent mm. and uh, the industry began to benefit I think from good apprenticeship control and the the value perception of the apprenticeship itself was, was part of my my brief to try and improve that there so I think that worked well. Okay, so in terms of how you would measure, um, you know, an apprentice's development um, through mm-hmm. through that process in terms of level two onwards, is it simply just that they progress to the next stage and that's kind of a, a well done, or is it uh, more detailed than that? It's a bit more detailed than that. Um, <clears throat> the the modern approach to apprenticeships, uh, I suppose, in the la- by modern, maybe in the last decade or two, as opposed to my own apprenticeship, uh, which was simply straightforward technical qualifications. Uh, the modern approach to apprenticeships there is really based around a training plan that uh, tries to tap into the individual needs of the young person, their their social needs, their uh, behavioural needs. Um, but also to meet the requirements of the standard itself. There's obviously technical assessments, practical assessments. Modern apprenticeship training is really also to try and look at the individual, the young person themselves, to form, help them form relationships, uh, build social bonds with others, work in teams, be able to coordinate uh, literacy, numeracy. All of those things have become uh, big drivers now to try and improve and strengthen uh, the all construction trades uh, efforts are towards uh, building better apprenticeships there. So uh, that, that, those those words, industry and numeracy, never featured in 1976, you know. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but or or social bonds, you know, those have all become uh, quite important features in trying to make the apprenticeship first of all attractive to school leavers. Uh, we've got to convince parents that it's worth sending their children, their their, their lovely ones. Uh, into a trade that is often perceived as being muck and dirt. Uh, mm. It's much better than that uh, and can produce a very good living 
and uh, 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 almost an unlimited progression from, from the apprenticeship right through to professional engineering status, as, as you well know. Yeah. So in, as part of your role in, in developing uh, the scheme and the apprenticeships and level two to level three progression for apprentices, how, how did you kind of fit in? How did you develop that within the Electrical Training Trust? Uh, well, it's a team effort. I've got to say, uh, I would like to say that uh, any one person can uh, shape or influence these things there. Government itself uh, sponsors funds, at least at that stage, the apprenticeship. So there's a compliance. You've got to meet the standard. Industry has an input into those standards. And again, you've got to have a firm ear and knowledge of what industry is expecting in terms of the technical and uh, practical standards. I suppose one of the things that we don't do terribly well, in, even today in apprenticeships, is teach productivity. Uh, we teach all the practical and technical things there. Uh, but we've got to remember that um, the, the apprenticeship is a means to an end for everybody. It's, uh, it's a, a commercial enterprise. It's a business. We, we don't do apprenticeships simply to do apprenticeships. We do business apprenticeships to produce uh, business benefit and a social benefit to our communities and to the UK economy. Um, so I suppose trying to help employers uh, understand that I understood their competitive needs mm. and also to try and help young people understand that their apprenticeship was a means to an end. It would benefit them and that they would end up with a good living, uh, with a, a predictable form of income throughout their lives, many opportunities to progress, uh, but also they had to play their part and exercise responsibility in becoming part of the, can I say it, and it sounds very crude, the profit-making uh, ob- uh, ambitions of their employer. It's, it has to be said. Yeah. So that was part of my, I think, part of my, contribution okay so you meant you mentioned about productivity um potentially being a, a weakness um in the development how how would you potentially address that moving forward uh yeah even even today i think um productivity as a science um isn't terribly well taught in the um the apprenticeship itself and it's something i think we've got to develop help apprentices and also help employers to help apprentices think about well how does their business work um there are costs uh to running the business overheads those two words can be very foreign to an apprentice so mm-hmm. i think helping them understand uh that we rely on profitability to sustain business and that the business is sustained employment and the um, development of the young person's career opportunity uh, and and income, their their value also. So I think that that be one thing I would, I would sort of like to see maybe develop a little bit more. It, it's a, a, a three way thing, isn't it? You know, uh, I suppose the training providers have got to figure out how to carry that message across, and sometimes it's it could be by bringing in contractors from the real world to talk about the challenge of profit and loss. Uh, Cash flow, the challenge of um, contract management, the difficulties of conflict and disruption and delay in contracts, the lack of productivity, material flow, all those things there, I I think, are uh, probably worth trying to to develop into the apprenticeship a little bit better uh, and make it really create, put everybody on the same page in terms of the objective of the, the contractor's business. So what's been some of the biggest challenges during your time in developing this? With the apprenticeship, um, I suppose economic challenges, um, the the competitive nature of uh, contracting here in, I suppose, Northern Ireland and maybe in the wider UK economy there, um, it can be sometimes difficult to persuade employers to recruit and retain apprentices. And, And I think it'd be fair to say that most uh, apprenticeships in their first year uh, perhaps don't have a, uh, a value contribution to the business. The employer's got to invest in honing that young person, shaping that young person, and exploring that young person's benefit to the business. Yeah. So it probably takes a year plus before 
that uh, that usefulness, uh, that uh, commercial usefulness of the uh, to the employer appears, and it's uh, persuading employers maybe to deal with that first year or two, and then all of a sudden, and I'd say that's maybe, maybe not quite all of a sudden, but there's a point comes where that young person becomes engaged with the needs of the business, and all of a sudden they start to see. Uh, uh, the enthusiasm, the uh, keenness for work, the, uh, the, the desire to meet the employer's uh, objectives start to kick in. But it's a two-way thing. Employers have got to reach out to and encourage the young person. Mm-hmm. And uh, in my experience, I've seen lots of really good examples of good employers uh, demonstrate a good example uh, of matching the young person with a good trades person, a good senior trades person there, very young person's experience around a variety of contracts, commercial, industrial, the agricultural, horticultural, allowed to see a variety of types of works. <clears throat> That's a big plus for the young person there. Uh, mm-hmm. So employers have got their part to play as well. And I think it's just, again, trying to build that team to help allow everybody to see the overall objective of the contractor's business uh, requirements. Mm-hmm. Have you found that uh, maybe Northern Ireland slightly separately to the, to the UK that you've experienced a skills shortage and that you've <coughs> struggled to bring uh, young people into the industry? I think the problem of that is widespread. From Edinburgh, Cardiff, London, Belfast, we have a common experience of making our industry attractive. Um, other industries, uh, example, IT, financial services, but indeed other trades uh, have outbid the electrical industry uh, since my time of entering the trade. Uh, back in 1976, my mother and father, like many other mother and fathers, were very keen for uh, their sons, mostly very few daughters, to uh, enter the electrical trade. It was perceived then to be the top trade. I think we've lost a little bit of that in the last uh, decade or more, and um, other sectors have outbid us. They've uh, made their, their their offering much more attractive to uh, potential school leavers. Um, the pathways, the perception by mum and dad, which is very important, has um, uh, has been better couched. The um, I suppose there's an attitudinal issue in society too. Towards maybe uh, construction trades, they, they look mucky, they look difficult. Uh, mm. You and I know that that's not the case. There, there's <laughs> parts of that, but it's also technical and uh, challenged and very, very interesting. So uh, we, we've had some difficulties in Northern Ireland. There's no doubt. It's a smaller economy. We have 1.8 million people here. It's just less than three percent of the UK. Um, so we've had some challenges there. Uh, but I would say this: we've also seen some remarkable. Um, uh, effort on the heart of on on the path of Northern Ireland contractors uh, breaking out and working deep into Europe and also right now throughout the UK and many of our leading contractors uh, work uh, uh, all parts of the UK today and um, take their apprentices with them there and that is a, a a very enriching experience for for young people being able to see the scale and size of contracts and projects that perhaps wouldn't exist here in our little community. Hmm. Yeah, no, that sounds sounds positive. Uh, yeah, the com- so. the com- yeah, definitely. Um, so probably back onto yourself then. Obviously, you've spent some time now, uh, probably getting on for what twenty years with the Electrical Training Trust. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> you can see the whiskers. <laughs> um, so at some point, obviously, in that journey, um, you've decided to, or, or there's been a collective decision to develop this Spark Safe. Yes. Um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. if you don't mind, please. Um, the Electrical Training Trust is a registered charitable trust. So that, that was part of the draw for me to join the organisation. Um, and the, our, our mandate, if you like, our, our broad mandate is to try and do good things in the industry, to try and improve the industry. And we've talked a little bit about apprenticeships here, and that certainly would be dear to my heart. Um, but also to try and bring uh, or address some of the long-term criticisms that arise from within the industry, from workers and employers, um, moans and groans about you know how poor things are, how bad things are. Um, and my 
uh, my employers are a voluntary board of directors. They oversee the work here, the trust. Uh, they do that in an entirely voluntary capacity. Uh, would say uh, we're convicted by the idea of trying to uh, stop or halt the decline of the industry in some way. So the idea of uh, bringing forward a license to practice idea, some way of, uh, I suppose the key words were uh, creating transparency in the industry there to try and address uh, long-term problems, uh, one of which was the use of underqualified, unqualified and self-designated electrical workers to effectively subsidise low-cost and sub-economic tendering. And um, that presented lots of difficulties uh, to try and figure out how we go about doing that. My own previous lengthy experience in the estimated department uh, uh, allowed me to tap into, you know, how does the whole uh, commercial circle work? So typically, and this is not always the case, but typically um, we see tender notices going out into the public arena. Contractors apply for those. They complete PQQs. Uh, they progress then to an invitation to tender. They, they bid the thing out. They may then get the award and the contract gets launched and it's underway. So those are the broad headings. I sat down and with a number of other people and started examining, well, how could we convert that into a visible, transparent process that all the key stakeholders to the contract, the particular project, could uh, enter into there? So my own conviction is this, that uh, clients are the main drivers. Clients write the checks. Clients if they want quality and good standards and they want to avoid latent defects and lengthy snagging lists and faulty workmanship there, they've got to enter in and join the drive towards improving quality and decent standards in the industry there. So I sat down and plotted out, literally on a bit of paper, how we do this here. I took the whole thing to an IT company and said, can we uh, put this into uh, an online solution that gives the client the main contractor, who sometimes can be the electric contractor and the electric contractor, and then critically join the individual work uh, workers in each specific contract. Um, so that took a couple of years to develop uh, from a technical IT point of view there. Uh, we also, of course, then had to lobby uh, and make sure the industry understood what we were trying to do. And uh, listen very carefully to the industry. And I mean, that means listen to small enterprises, large enterprises, who sometimes got very competing agendas. Um, our industry itself has greatly changed from the days I entered the trade. Uh, when I joined my employer, they, he, he was employing over 120 uh, electricians directly, pay as you earn, at right. some point during my apprenticeship. Now, typically, that's a very rare thing today with uh, even large enterprises where we've, we've been obliged for, for, for different reasons to sublet and subcontract uh, uh, into various cascading levels uh, the, 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 the performance of the contract. So the SparkSafe idea was really to try, I suppose, initially to address the, um, the decline of the industry and its dependency on underqualified, unqualified people. Hmm. Um, so, if I, so you mentioned obviously getting it part of the, the contract tendering process. Yes. Where, where, where did you envisage that coming in, uh, like the pre-qualification questionnaire kind of stage? Yes. Uh, well, uh, initially we uh, approached the Northern Ireland procurement organisations here who... Uh, uh, a receipt of uh, large sums of public money for education, health, uh, infrastructure, social housing, so forth there. And we approached them and sat down with them and had a conversation. And they recognised, all of them, I think, that there was a difficulty in the quality and the standard, the calibre of people. They, they were blind, essentially blindsided, to who actually was appearing on the contracts. Uh, 
so Sparksafe was really designed to try and uh, reveal uh, very clearly uh, the makeup of the workforce. And we refer to that on our website. If you've been on today, you see the workforce composition report. And that's a key, unique feature of the, the Sparksafe system. Right. OK. So what's been some of the challenges you've faced in establishing Sparksafe? It's an expensive <laughs> uh, <laughs> process. Yeah. It's a lengthy process. So it's time and money. Uh, you've got to be very patient. Um, we've got to overcome, uh, I think, as, uh, as we said yesterday in the media, reasonable objections from people. Um, uh, on the ground, uh, there, there's mixed uh, views sometimes about anybody that tries to do anything to address the long term difficulties of our industry there. So overcoming I suppose, uh, false accusations, uh, uh, or, or maybe accusations that I've clearly thought of it. Um, doing something new always attracts difficulties, uh, Gary, as you know. Uh, so, uh, communicating, uh, I would say that was one of the big issues. So, for my, my own part, I am entirely comfortable going out and speaking to the men on the ground and occasionally the women. Uh, so I went out and met with large groups of um, manual workers, uh, their employers, uh, and, and I've been happy to do that. I uh, have travelled around uh, our own little province and also many parts of the UK to talking to uh, owner, business owners and electrical workers there. So communication is very important. Quite a difficult thing to do uh, because you've got, obviously, on the other end of that communication, people come with predetermined ideas um, and, and just, I suppose, the, the, the normal uh, difficulties there are in trying to persuade people to do something new and do something different. And so there's no saying if, if, we don't, if we don't change something, you know, nothing will change. We'll just keep doing the same thing the same way. And, and that was part of my mission is to try and ha- cause people to think about doing something different. So that, that was part of it, one of the main problems, communicating. Okay, so that's interesting. So... Have you found the the main objections coming from the guys who are, and gals who are working on the ground, or or from the business side of things? Uh, I, I think it's been mixed. Um, on the whole, my experience has been um, that the vast majority of electrical workers, who, when the matter and the idea is carefully put to them, can see that there is. Um, an attempt to drive the industry forward and do something good. But it takes a little while to persuade people to do that. Uh, because, well, our industry, I think, and I understand this very well, is full of scepticism, cynicism, doubt. Um, and there's been a lot of, I think, uh, constructive criticism levied against many organisations, including the, the small organisation I work for there. But it's been prepared to step forward and address those questions and not duck away or hide behind, but simply come forward. So I think that's been, been part of the problem, you know. Um, with employers now, uh, I, uh, and I say this with great respect to all employers, because I understand the, the absolute uh, commercial difficulties that employers have to try and stay in business. But I would say that there is a, a vast body of what I would call responsible employers who want to improve and change the industry there. And those are the employers that are most responsive to well thought through, uh, intelligent, carefully uh, developed ideas. And, and those are the employers we've stuck to there. I think there are other employers who that's not their experience and they're not in that part of the journey. And they uh, see these things as problematic difficulties to try to get around or avoid or not participate in. And there's nothing new in that, Gary. We've seen that you know, right across all trades and all other sectors, you know. So we, mm. we've, we've tried to concentrate on those employers who maybe have a mind to try and do something to change, improve the industry, because they see the benefit and for them, of course, is that it improves the value proposition of the industry itself uh, and how the industry is perceived, perhaps. And we've seen many other industries shoot ahead of us um, uh, over the last 20 years there and leave us uh, slipping down the trade ladder a little bit there. So I think talking to those employers is very important. Mm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. 
what, what are some of the successes you've had then with SparkSafe? Uh, well, the, the major success has been to persuade uh, one part of the UK government to embrace thoroughly the concept of SparkSafe. And uh, we, we've seen um, at least, well, uh, it's well over a billion pounds worth of um, uh, capital project work now being subject to the SparkSafe system. And that means that all the electrical workers, um, including apprentices um, and the qualified workers, uh, become subject to that system. Um, Two other things I would mention, and these I think are particularly worth noting. We have uh, managed here to see um, a driver, a fresh new driver, injected into the industry to drive on continuous professional development. So one of the uh, conditions that we negotiated with the government procurement authorities here was that all fully qualified electricians must have in their possession an up-to-date accreditation in the current edition of BS7671, which, as you know, at the present time happens to be a team. So we managed to break through that with government, and they said, yes, we can understand the logic and the reason for that there. So they agreed with us that all fully qualified electricians on the SparkSafe register must possess an accreditation in BS7671. So that was a real breakthrough for us. The second thing uh, was... We've had some problems, um, and I think in parts of England and maybe other parts of the UK, there have been similar problems where there's been alternative apprenticeship schemes. And these are these are lesser schemes that uh, are, are, are maybe designed to feed into a true apprenticeship, but often don't. And many of these young people who join those schemes uh, step off them and enter the trade, enter the industry there uh, with, can I say, loose change qualifications, bits of units but never go on to become fully qualified. So the licence of practice system in Northern Ireland brought an end to that approach. And the only people now, the only young people that can be issued with a licence for the apprenticeship licence are those who are undertaking the industry approved level three diploma. And uh, I, I, I champion that as a, as a good result for the industry there. So the driving for CPD and the uh, discrimination in favour of level three diploma apprenticeships only. I think those are two things I would certainly highlight. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's brilliant news that you've had such uh, good backing from the government. Um, yes, indeed. Have, have you found uh, them a challenge into receiving that, that backing or have they been fairly receptive in terms of the progression and development of the industry? Uh, uh, do you mean the employers, the industry or the... Uh, the, the government specifically? Uh, no, well, government, I think, here has been very accessible. We've been able to go and talk to them. Uh, they haven't been too distant. And uh, we've been able to sit down and talk with uh, leading civil servants um, who, I think, recognised the problems from um, many other uh, uh, responsible people who seek to contribute to improving the standards in the industry, including training providers and other industry sectors. So we, we weren't pushing against a closed door. The door was opened. Um, government, I think, is interested in trying to um, improve the quality and raise the standards uh, to encourage school leavers into uh, careers where there is uh, sustainability of employment, where there's progression, where there's great opportunities. And uh, so I, I didn't find it terribly difficult to engage with them around that matter. Uh, as you know, Gary, we live and work and make our living through technical issues. And sometimes, OK, so just sometimes bringing along the technical nuances of the trade, what we call people, how we define competency, qualifications, what is an electrician. Uh, we've, we've had to go through that in quite detail with uh, to try and, I suppose, persuade and achieve a common understanding of what we mean by those things that would be acceptable uh, on all parts of the argument, and we include the training providers, mm. contractors, business owners, the young people, mums and dads, uh, the disgruntled <laughs> worker who doesn't know what on earth are you guys doing. You, you've got to have all those, all, all that argument. So we've taken a bit of time to kind of define what we believe things are, 
and record those on our website. And uh, I make myself very accessible to speak to anyone about uh, about those matters. Right. Well, that's, um, I mean, it's, it's fantastic news. You, you, you kind of highlighted CPD as well. Obviously, there's been a lot of um, discussion uh, recently about uh, CPD within the industry and its place. Um, do you, you see it firmly? It has a, a, a good place in terms of the progression of uh, electricians, apprentices alike? Well, uh, as I, I, I hate saying this, but as an old hand of the industry, you know, I have been able to look back now over almost 40 years of a career in the trade and see tremendous changes, positive changes in how we do things. Much better, much quicker, much more efficient, uh, lots of opportunity. Um, and it's, a, it's an exciting time. And I commend those uh, who you and I both know, including yourself, who are seeking to promote CPD uh, to stir up uh, existing workers and inspire new entrants to press on and acquire more and more knowledge and skills and uh, interest in how to do the trade. So I'm all for that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, my uh, efforts uh, with my colleagues here at uh, SparkSafe to encourage CPD is a key message that we want to put out. So that, that's why we um, uh, kind of insisted that the 18th edition would be, and it's unique, at least it was unique, a feature for us there, uh, a requirement to be a fully qualified electrician there. And that worked and makes sense. Um, so that's it. What continues, uh, what, what, what keeps your fires burning? What keeps your drive going um, to continue doing what you're doing after such a long time? Ah, well, I mean, the industry itself, despite all the difficulties, it's, uh, I, I suppose what we see in our trade, you see it, and I see it, is the landscape changes, literally changes over a period of time. Uh, plant gets activated, machines get switched on, lights get switched on in buildings, people begin to occupy them, factories begin to... So it's a very dynamic, moving environment, so... Anybody who's been involved in construction, no matter what end of it is there, you always drive by the building that you worked in or that you recognise. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you're anything like me, I try to spot cranes on the horizon, see <laughs> who's building what, what's going on in that city. Uh, so I think there's still lots to keep me interested and lots to keep our industry interested in the uh, how we change the landscape, how we improve our communities and our society with buildings and change environment. So, yeah, I think it's still there for me. So do, in terms of SparkSafe, do you feel you've kind of achieved as, as much as it can or there's still plenty for you to go and, and target? I, yeah, I, 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 it would be a dull old world if we stopped, you know. <laughs> no, I, I'm absolutely convinced we've got to keep going. Uh, by no means have we persuaded or engaged with the whole of the industry. Uh, some would say, and it's probably not that far away, there are over 300,000 electrical workers in the UK, at least. Um, SparkSafe has only touched a fraction of those guys and those businesses. Um, and indeed, probably two thirds of that number sit well outside of any recognised uh, industry body. Uh, and, and I'm not suggesting that is um, the, the Wild West at all. But what I'm suggesting is that there's an absence of consistency and control and standards. Uh, and uh, it, it's manifest itself, I think, every day in every construction, almost every construction site in the Kingdom and in Northern Ireland where there is no control. If you ask the typical uh, gatekeeper of any large site how many qualified people are on that job, they probably won't know. Mm. Um, and uh, because they're reliant on this uh, well, it's no longer a modern method of subletting work into various levels of uh, subcontract uh, work packages and groups and even individuals. And uh, the ability to uh, control and comprehend who is on the job, how qualified they are to do this work, um, uh, is often uh, simply passed by the idea that they've simply got a health and safety passport. That gets them on the site. What we are interested in is their occupational competency, 
their occupational identity, mm. their occupational qualifications. And I think, ultimately, that's what will improve our industry, the value proposition of employers, and the, the profitability of our industry. Um, and, and, and so there's lots to do, Gary. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I, I can probably agree with, with most of what you're saying from yeah. the, what I've seen from both sides of the coin working as a subcontractor and a, and a tier one contractor. Yeah. It's been <clears throat> that on the subcontract side, it's like you say, look at margins, it's look at overheads, get, cut the costs down to bare minimum to make it profitable or yeah. even just cost efficient. And then on the other side, it certainly from the main contractor's <clears> point of view, it tends to be a risk-based approach. I'm, I'm forever seeing risk and opportunity schedules, mm. and and the risk is all the risk is we do the work ourselves, we bodge it up, we have to pay for it, or we can just pass all that risk to a subcontractor and they can complete the work and then they yes. have to fi- they have to fix it. Yes. And and unfortunately, I think that is probably where the industry is headed on the whole yeah. um but hopefully things like uh, spark safe in the tender process can obviously capture the competencies needed so that even further reducing the risk yes well i think so uh all of the processes all the things you talked about there you know the 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 contract the money that flows in contracts the material that's purchased None of that can happen unless we have the people. And uh, most MDs and HR people say our people are the most important thing. You know, so mm. we've got to follow through on that and make sure that that's absolutely true uh, when it comes to engaging people uh, to do construction work, especially. And I, I say this without uh, hesitation, especially electrical work, because it's dangerous. It can destroy lives, destroy buildings. It can be just long-term difficulties for building owner operators there. So, uh, I, I think we, we we need to pull our socks up as an industry there and make sure that we're only employing qualified, competent workers and being transparent about how we do that there. And by doing that there, uh, how our industry is perceived by the client and by main contractors and by the public will improve. We've got to do that. I think that's probably a, a brilliant message to to end on. To be perfectly honest, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. But, but I but I do have uh, one last question for you. Um, it's one I ask to every guest. Uh, what's your favourite movie? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gosh, uh, yeah. Oh dear, oh, I'm stuck. Uh, I, I could say my favourite recent movie. Okay, it's a bit of a long title. Uh, my wife and I watched it and thoroughly enjoyed it, and it was called the Jersey uh, Potato Peel Book Club. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Absolutely brilliant. What's uh, that about? It's uh, it's a little love story. Right. Okay. You're yeah. A bit romantic at heart. <laughs> well, <laughs> on that particular case, it certainly was. Yeah. Uh, I made up the right title there, but it's, it was an excellent movie there. It's a couple of years back there, but uh, yeah, it was good. Excellent. Well, <laughs> on, on that note, thank you very much for your time okay. today, Derek. Thank you, Gary. And thank you, everyone, for listening.